Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Frontiers in Oncology. We have a special speaker this morning, Dr. Heather Wakeley, whom all of you know. Dr. Wakeley was raised in Sonoma County. She ventured eastward to go to Princeton and then to Hopkins for medical school. And then after that tour of the East Coast, she came back to California, to Stanford for her residency in internal medicine. And she was um, the chief resident during that time, then became an oncology fellow at Stanford. She became an attending in oncology in 2003. She founded and helped uh, shape and develop the Thoracic Oncology Clinic. She became the CRG leader in thoracic oncology. She has won uh, many awards, including the Oncology Division Teaching Award numerous times. She was named the ECOG Akron Young Investigator in 2015. She has uh, assumed many leadership roles around the country, including leadership role in ECOG Akron. And most recently, she's been named the president for the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. Heather has also been integrally involved in clinical research from a different perspective because she's been the medical director of our CCTO. She, of course, has been a, an incredibly accomplished clinical scientist and made critical contributions to the treatment of lung cancer through clinical trials uh, and widespread collaborations with uh, many of our investigators studying lung cancer at Stanford and many collaborators throughout the country. Uh, she became interim chief of oncology <clears throat> several months ago, and we're thrilled to have her um, with us this morning. And um, she has an exciting talk to share with us. Um, just of note, please, when you have questions for Heather, please enter them in the Q&A box uh, below at the bottom of your screen. So welcome, Heather. Great. OK. Um, so I'm going to be giving an overview that uh, starts off with talking about sort of what I've done with my research to date, and then switching up and really talking about a, a vision for the future. So I decided to title this from intern to chief, a tale of partnerships and persistence with a vision for the future. Um, and then the, in medical oncology at Stanford, but you all know that. All right, and, and thank you, Steve, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to be able to present um, in this great uh, forum. So, all right, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so this is the overview. So I'm gonna talk about adjuvant therapy. It's one of the areas I've done the most work in um, and titled that the persistence and you'll understand why soon. Then talk about some of the other research and clinical endeavors uh, which is really about the partnerships. So research, patient care and education and then a vision for the division, which brings in the partnerships especially, but also persistence. So this is a little timeline for my training and uh, finding mentors. So my first day at Stanford was in 1996 when I arrived on Med 10. I'll note I was uh, about an hour late because I'd gotten the time wrong, but that, that didn't uh, forebode any problems in the future. Um, I actually got to present at Asilomar. Uh, so we just had our fabulous Asilomar retreat last week. Um, and I, I got to present as a resident, so that was my first presentation there, and, and really the first time I got to know the oncology division quite well. Uh, in 2000, I finished my chief residency and started fellowship, and then um, 2002 during fellowship was the first time I went to an ECOG meeting. So uh, this is one of the U.S. Uh, NCI cooperative groups, now part of the NCTN. And uh, that was really important for meeting a lot of other people doing lung cancer work. It's also the first time I went to an international conference. Then from 2003, when I was in my fellowship, I really worked hard on developing a mentor network. Lung cancer at the time wasn't a very exciting world. Uh, we really just had uh, chemotherapy and it was slow progress. For that reason, there weren't as many people focused on it um, at Stanford. And so it was really an opportunity me, for me to kind of think about what could we do to offer more to patients suffering with lung cancer? How could we really move that, that research forward? I met with a lot of outstanding external mentors. So Joan Schiller, uh, who has been instrumental over many years, and she's been a part of, uh, she was at Eddie Cog Akron at the time. Um, David Gandera, who's at UC Davis and has continued to be a really key mentor as well throughout my career. Suresh Ramalingan, who is a friend and mentor. Uh, we were actually at fairly uh, 
equal levels in our training, um, but has been there every step of the way. And then there are many, many others too numerous to name. And of course, important people at Stanford as well. Uh, so Charlotte Jacobs, George Fisher, uh, Brandy Sickage, and then Alan Ewan among, again, many, many others. I think I've been touched by everyone I've worked with um, in really important ways in developing, helping to develop my career and providing the support along the way. Um, so in 2003, I also did a little extra part to my fellowship, which was that I actually drove to UC Davis to work with Dr. Gandera and his team weekly for a while. So I could really get that in-depth experience treating lung cancer patients, given that we just didn't have as many people focused on that here. Okay, so this was my first big presentation. It was an ASCO poster and I actually received a merit award that this was my senior year as a fellow. Um, so this was pretty exciting. And it was also the first big jump into early stage uh, lung cancer therapy. So this was looking back at an older trial, uh, looking at post-operative radiation um, and chemo radiation for early stage lung cancer, and was looking at what were the outcomes, what was the um, sort of unanticipated death, not just the cancer deaths related to the radiation. And this was an interesting uh, experience because the initial look had one outcome. And then as I was able to dive deeper, pull out a lot of death certificates, do a further analysis, kind of change those results. And so it really was eye-opening and to some of the pitfalls, but also the strength of, of doing sort of really in-depth analyses from clinical trial work. Um, and along the way, work closely with a lot of other people from ECOG Akron um, who continue to be important. Okay, so that's the background. So what's the tale of adjuvant therapy? So around the time I was ending my training, um, these first trials came out that showed that there really was a benefit to adjuvant chemotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer. I remember in my fellowship meeting with patients who had had surgery for lung cancer and telling them that even though we knew there was a high risk their cancer would return, we didn't have anything that we could offer them that we knew would make a difference. And then these trials came out. So the most famous is the um, YALTS trial, IALT. And this was a randomized phase three trial, global, which looked at giving people four cycles of cisplatin-based chemotherapy or not after completion of their surgery in a complete resection. And this study did show a survival benefit, overall survival hazard ratio 0.86. It was statistically significant, but obviously that's not a huge benefit. We quote around a 5% overall survival benefit. So it was enough to change practice, but left us all with the feeling that there was more that we should be able to do. Shortly thereafter, ECOG Akron um, presented this study and Dr. Alan Sandler was the lead that looked at the addition of bevacizumab, um, the VEGF antibody. Um, and this drug had already shown really significant improvements in patients with colorectal cancer. This trial, ECOG 4599, established that if bevacizumab was given in combination with carboplatin paclitaxel for newly diagnosed non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer, you could actually improve survival. And this was the first time we had been able to add anything to chemotherapy for advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer. So this was really, really impactful at the time. And you can see here the survival curves. Again, it's not huge. It was only a two month difference in median survival, but it was the first time in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer, we crossed the 12 month mark for overall survival in a big phase three trial. And it was also um, the first time we'd added anything to chemo with success. So it was really a big deal. And so sitting in the ECOG Akron meeting room, I remember very clearly, we were looking at this, we were talking about the adjuvant data and the idea, of course, was born um, that, well, why don't we look at adding bevacizumab to chemotherapy for patients with resected lung cancer and see if we can actually improve outcomes, improve cure rates. At the time, I had been to several of the ECOG Akron meetings. I had published uh, several retrospective reviews with them. And they were of a mindset that they wanted to be supporting more junior people uh, within ECOG Akron. And thus, I was actually asked to be the overall PI, uh, PI the study chair, um, for ECOG 
1505. This was the adjuvant non-small cell lung cancer trial looking at the addition of bevacizumab to chemotherapy. So this then became a decade of work um, and it was tremendously impactful because it allowed me into the world of um, all the people who were really the world leaders in treating non-small cell lung cancer um, as I developed this trial with a lot of input from many people and then was able to lead it through to completion. So this is the schema, it's fairly simple, resected early stage lung cancer, chemotherapy for four cycles, the new standard of care, plus or minus bevacizumab, and then long-term follow-up. Um, and one of the things that we did when designing this trial is we knew that there were a lot of questions about which chemotherapy regimen was best. And so we actually took all of the approved cisplatin-based regimens for advanced stage lung cancer and allowed people to choose amongst them for the, with the patients and picking which regimen to give. Um, and then later on added another regimen with pemetrexid when that became a first line option. And so this became one of the really key parts of the study. It wasn't the primary endpoint, but it allowed us to get some insight into which chemotherapy regimens to use. So the primary objective was whether or not we could change overall survival with the addition of bevacizumab. We also were looking at many other things, including a really detailed tissue and blood collection. We assumed at the time that we wouldn't know what the technology would be by the time this trial ended, knowing it was gonna take many years. So we didn't pre-specify exactly what we were gonna do with the um, samples, but we knew we needed them and we needed really um, regular collections um, during the time of treatment so we could hopefully get some better insight as to who was benefiting and who wasn't. We also looked at smoking status and outcomes related to that. So the trial actually enrolled uh, 1501 patients, so it was quite a big study. And this occurred between 2007 to 2013. Um, at the sixth planned interim analysis, the Independent Data Safety Monitoring Committee actually recommended that the study be uh, closed with trial information released unfortunately due to futility. Um, I was able to present this at a plenary meeting of the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. So we have an annual meeting uh, through that conference. Um, and this is really the, the biggest lung cancer conference um, that we have every year globally. Um, it's multidisciplinary, it's international. I'm obviously very involved in the organization. So to be able to present this in a plenary there was, was a pretty big deal for me, very exciting. These, this is the data that was presented. Um, unfortunately, there was no benefit seen with the addition of bevacizumab. Fortunately, there was also no harm seen, um, but you can see looking at the overall survival curve on the left, no difference, um, hazard ratio 0.99, disease-free survival also hazard ratio 0.99. And so we walked away realizing that even though this drug was quite beneficial for metastatic disease, it was not helpful in early stage in changing outcomes. We also went back and looked at the different chemotherapy regimens, as I um, previously explained. We thought it was important to model real world practice by giving people options of choosing based on a lot of other aspects of the chemotherapy, sometimes histology, um, but also based on differences in toxicity. Um, and you can see here that when we analyzed that data, there was no statistically significant difference. Here we broke it up by non-squamous and squamous. The difference being that pemetrexid is only given to the patients with non-squamous histology. And that ended up being by far the most popular uh, regimen that was utilized because of the toxicity profile. So uh, you can see there was no real difference. And we're, we're actually going through and, and looking at this still in a little bit more detail with publication coming out hopefully soon, um, working on that still. But we did publish the, the primary outcome in Lancet Oncology. Um, this was 2017 um, and again showing the no benefit. We were hoping to be able to do very detailed tissue and sample analysis, but that has taken far longer than initially anticipated um, with some changes within the cooperative group system. Um, there's a very detailed process to be able to do the work on these uh, samples. Uh, so it's taken quite a while, but we're actually finally getting there. Um, and actually, uh, fortunately, Max Dean uh, was one of the, the winners of our uh, big um, RFA to be able to figure out what to do with the samples. So we're going to be doing some very detailed molecular analyses 
um, before this trial was started, we knew nothing about the driver mutations. Now we know quite a bit about driver mutations in non-false cell lung cancer and how those behave differently. We also know that there are um, quite big differences in the histology where most of the driver mutations such as EGFR and alkin ross that we think about tend to all be in adenocarcinoma or non-squamous histology. There also are very strong interactions between VEGF inhibition and inhibition of a lot of those driver mutations. So there's a suspicion that there will be differences in outcome if we can understand some of the driver mutations. And so that work is, is ongoing. Um, trying to understand uh, predictors of benefit from anti-VEGF agents has been a, a long lesson in frustration over many years. And we continue to really um, grapple with that. So I don't know that we'll get to any answers there, but we're continuing to look in that aspect as well. So, so more analysis ongoing, and this continues to be um, a really important data set for us to better understand. Okay, so what about next steps in adjuvant? Well, I think you all know that um, in the last few years, the most exciting, the two big areas of lung cancer that have changed. One is in, is in the driver mutation arena. I'm not going to talk about that today, but the other is in the PD-1 and PDL one checkpoint inhibitors. And in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer, this has really revolutionized um, the treatment for patients with uh, advanced stage lung cancer, except those with driver mutations. Um, and so this is a table with some of the big phase three first line trials looking at adjuvant, I'm sorry, not adjuvant, but advanced stage disease, looking at either giving um, checkpoint inhibitors alone versus chemo or in combination with chemo. And at this point, except for patients who have driver mutations who get targeted treatments, almost all of our patients with advanced stage lung cancer are treated with a checkpoint inhibitor, either alone or in combination with chemotherapy. So this has completely changed the way we think about treating advanced stage disease. So of course, the next step then is to bring it into early stage disease. And so these are some of the ongoing adjuvant trials using checkpoint inhibitors. You can see on the left, we have the names of the checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab, atezolizumab, dervalumab, pembrolizumab. The trial designs are fairly similar for all of them looking at early stage disease, patients who have had complete resections, and then randomizing them to either get or not get the checkpoint inhibitor. Most of the trials are placebo controlled. I've drawn a red box around uh, this uh, one particular trial with the tezolizumab um, in power 010. And that's because of the work I had done on ECOG 1505. I have played a key role in development of this trial um, actually, 1505, the backbone of that trial was used to, to kind of write this whole study design um, and have been working very closely with the team throughout as we have um, been continuing conduct of the study. So um, all of these trials have now completed enrollment. Uh, we haven't seen any results yet, um, but we all remain very hopeful that when the outcomes do come forward, we are going to be able to change how people who have had resected lung cancer are treated and hopefully improve cure rates. So that's very exciting ongoing work in the adjuvant field. We've also brought the checkpoint inhibitors into the neoadjuvant or prior to surgery arena. Um, there, there's been a lot of data um, from smaller trials looking at giving patients either checkpoint inhibitors alone or in combination with chemotherapy with some really phenomenal outcomes when you look at the major pathological response rates. We still don't have the um, meaningful outcomes such as uh, disease-free survival and overall survival. Many of those trials are not randomized, so we'll never know exactly uh, what that means. But these big phase three trials have all been launched, again, with the same known checkpoint inhibitors. And I've drawn a red box around the, the pembrolizumab, the Keynote 671, um, because I've been able to be a part of that steering committee. Again, based on the prior work I had done with 1505, and then um, the expertise in that arena. So we uh, still have that open at Stanford are actively enrolling patients into it, um, as well as uh, kind of keeping awareness of what's happening with the trial globally. Okay, so that's the tale of persistent and adjuvant therapy. And um, I talked about it in the terms of persistence because unfortunately, despite quite a long time of working in that area, we have yet to really move the needle, but I think we're poised um, on the brink of being able to do that. 
So what else have I been doing in thoracic oncology? Um, so this is a, a busy slide, um, but I wanted to try to capture a whole lot of different things in the middle, talk about um, the vision to understand the etiology of lung cancer, best screening strategies, technology to follow a disease course, best therapeutic options at all stages, personalized therapy, including targeted therapy and immune therapy. So if we kind of go around clockwise, uh, we've got the anti-angiogenesis. So talked about bevacizumab in the adjuvant world, also done a lot of work with VEGFR TKIs. Unfortunately, we haven't moved the bar too far, um, but one of those VEGFR TKIs, cabozantinib, has been an area of significant work for Joel Neal, one of my um, fabulous colleagues, um, in, including within ecog um, with ongoing work there as well. Um, and, and that seems to potentially play very well with some of the checkpoint inhibitors. So though the uh, VEGFR TKIs alone haven't panned out as well, um, I think there's still a future forward for them. We've done a tremendous amount of work within our group and, and globally in lung cancer looking at other targets. So back around the time my career was just getting started, we learned about the importance of epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors or EGFR. And I've got uh, uh, one little circle here for those as well. We've played a huge role at Stanford in many of those trials, establishing the importance of VEGFR TKIs instead of chemotherapy, and then trying to figure out how do we best continue to help patients when the first VEGFR TKIs they're on stop working. And so that's been, again, multiple collaborations with many people. These other um, targets are also critical. So ALK and BRAF and MET um, and RET and HER2 and others. Um, collaborations with Max Dean and Ash Elizade um, and their whole teams looking at um, ways to test for these. And then also working with many, many companies um, and many people on better technologies and better strategies, including better drugs, to be able to target these. And so that's been really important. It's also been a lot of projects for many fellows as they've been able to look, um, do deep dives, looking at our patients at Stanford with each of these different driver mutations. Thymic malignancies, um, so I, I'm not talking about that too much today, but I've done a lot of work in thymoma and thymic carcinoma. Um, also had the opportunity to work with many fabulous colleagues. I'm gonna mention Suki Pada, where she's done a, a lot of great work there too. And we've been part of the International Thymic Malignancies Interest Group, which has been some really important collaborations there as we move forward and, and how to best treat that very rare disease. Um, I'm gonna highlight next the population science work. So have done, um, had some amazing collaborations there, Women's Health Initiative with Marcia Stefanik that spanned many years of, of work. And then a particular interest in lung cancer and never smokers and lung cancer and Asian Americans with um, Scarlett Gomez, formerly at the Cancer Prevention Institute of California, now at UCSF, um, along with Iona Chang, um, also doing work looking at second primary lung cancers with uh, Summer Han um, and medical student uh, Jackie Arredo is doing a lot of that work now. And I'm sure I'm missing others, but I think that those connections have been really, really important as we try to figure out not just how do we treat cancer once it's there, but what are the factors leading to development of cancer and how can we find it early enough that we can hopefully have curative interventions as opposed to focusing all of these other therapies. And then, of course, a lot of work that's translationally focused with many, many collaborators here at Stanford and beyond. I wanted to highlight our thoracic team. Um, so this is just, uh, obviously, many of these are pre-COVID, and I have one uh, peri-COVID uh, picture. Um, in the upper left, these are our uh, study coordinators. And we really do try to focus as a team approach. So. Um, all, all of us in thoracic oncology, so Joel Neal and Suki Pada and Kavitha Ramchandran and Millie Das, um, as well as Jane Wong, who uh, works with us, and now our latest uh, physician team member, Nathaniel Mile, we all work together with these with our coordinator team so that we are all thinking about the various trials. Um, different people are PI on different studies, but we all think of them together as a group, um, all of our trials. And the coordinators all work, not on every single trial, but partnered up. Um, so there's several people who know each of the studies. 
it's really a, a great teamwork effort. Um, couldn't imagine working without them. They're also very well known within clinic. And so this uh, couple of these pictures from social events of the past show that our clinical team and our research team are really all one team in thoracic. And that's been, that's led to really um, a, a fabulous working environment where we all are trying to keep first and foremost at the top of our mind, are we doing the best treatment option for each patient? And have we thought about a clinical trial at each point of transition in their care? And do we have a trial available for them at each point there as well? We also try to have a lot of fun together because let's face it, um, our work as oncologists is not easy. Um, and it's important that we are able to celebrate um, a lot of things and uh, time together, um, as well as that helps us to stay fresh and, and energized in our jobs. Um, and so this is our, uh, our more recent, um, peri-COVID party, of course, following all social distancing, masking, and uh, staying outside. So that's good. Okay, I'm now going to pivot and just do a very a brief mention of clinical care. Um, so I treated a lot of amazing people over the many years I've been an oncologist. Um, I highlight uh, this amazing work by Paul Kalanithi um, because Paul was able to capture in his book a lot of the messages I always try to talk about with, with my patients, Paul and I saw um, eye to eye in how we wanted to communicate with patients um, in regards to a lot of the, the, the thoughts that we have around how do you help guide someone through an illness where you can't cure them? Obviously, when we think about clinical care, we want to be able to cure people and have them live their life without their cancer. Uh, since we still aren't able to do that for a majority of our patients with metastatic disease, we then have to help them along their journey so that at each point we're working with them to best understand what are their goals, what are we able to offer them, how do we keep those two in alignment to help them to be able to live as long as possible feeling well, and also to help bring their families and loved ones along on that journey so that we're all there together when we reach the inevitable. Um, and that um, kind of trying to keep that in mind at all times, as well as always um, the empathy and kindness towards the patient, first and foremost, in every communication, those are really some of the guiding principles. And where this often comes up is that question that we hear all too often, how much time do I have? How, um, how do I plan? And um, Paul is I obviously was much more eloquent than I am and um, truly a philosopher and captured so much in this book uh, that were the things I always try to figure out how to say that he said much better. And so I wanted to just read this one quote of his, um, the reason doctors don't give patients specific prognosis is not nearly because they cannot. What patients seek is not scientific knowledge that doctors hide, but existential authenticity each person must find in his or her own. Getting too deeply into statistics is like trying to quench a thirst with salty water. The angst of facing mortality has no remedy and probability. So really, really powerful words to get to the, that question that we all try to help our patients guide, that idea of how do you balance this knowledge that you have a terminal diagnosis and trying to make the right choices in and what are you going to do with the time without losing that hope that perhaps that next treatment is going to make a big difference is right around the corner and, and finding that balance. I do a lot of, of talking about the balance. And um, so I, I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about that here, um, not the major focus of my talk, but at the heart of all that we do is the clinical care. It's trying to, to help the patients who are, are living with cancer. And so I couldn't give a talk without mentioning that. Okay, also really important to emphasize the education. Um, this is a table of, of mentees. You'll recognize a few names on here, such as uh, Dr. Pada, um, Dr. Rahatke, um, and many, many others that I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with. Um, who've all gone on to do amazing things. Um, we are in the thoracic group, we're working with four of our amazing Stanford fellows currently, Mohana Roy, Maya White, Arpit Shah, and Julie Wu. Hopefully some of the first years thinking about doing thoracic as well. And then um, I mentioned Jackie Rita already. She's really been a phenomenal um, uh, contributor in our thoracic field as a medical student and who's applying right now into residency. Okay, 
So that was the research side. Now I'm going to talk about the vision and really shifting from my research into our division of, of medical oncology. So as division, together we prioritize research, clinical care and education, and I've talked through that journey that I've had in all of those areas. For research, talking about partnerships with uh, SCI, with Steve Artandi at the lead, uh, with the CCTO, um, where we have the infrastructure for all of our clinical research, Elizabeth Anderson is the director. Laboratory, translational, clinical, population sciences, and talk a little bit about the CRG structures, um, and then network partnerships. For clinical care, uh, talk about partnerships we have with the Department of Medicine and with the hospital. Education, and that's partnerships and mentoring as well as uh, with our uh, trainees. So this is a statement I wanted to kind of, as I try to think about what are all the things that really are important and then having a vision statement moving forward. So um, the way I, I think about this is working together so really emphasizing the partnerships, working together to provide world-class research, clinical care, and education focused on eradicating cancer. And when I think about our division, I really see us as having a really central role. So that's why I, I drew medical oncology here. Now, granted, I might have a medical oncology-centric view of the universe, but if as the chief of the division, I don't, who, who does? So I think this is okay. Um, so focusing on who are we, the medical oncologists, we're really at the heart of the Cancer Institute. We're, we're one of the biggest pieces in my perspective for the Department of Medicine, because you think about how much cancer impacts so many people um, and with that impact can influence many other things that are going on in their general health. So it's a really big aspect of, of health for adults in general, which is why I think we're such a core part of the Department of Medicine. When you think about the hospital, and again, think about how many patients are in the hospital at any given time receiving their care related to a cancer diagnosis, really key there. And then as we think about um, expansion beyond the core in Palo Alto within the network, growth within the cancer field is, is driving a lot of that as well. And so I think those are really, really important. And, and these lines are all really representing those key partnerships that we have with all of these different aspects of the whole research and um, enterprise. And I realized I didn't put the university on here, but I think that needs to be there as well. So who are we as a division? Well, we actually have 55 faculty. Um, I don't think I fully realized that myself until I was in this position. 15 are the clinician ex educators. Three have split time either um, with, uh, we have one who's split with UHA and two at the VA. 13 are clinical assistant professors and two are clinical associate professors. So very much shifted towards the earlier career people. We have five instructors, two of whom are transitioning to MCL assistant professors. We have 21 in our MCL line, seven assistant professors, six associate, eight professors. And so that's a nice balance. Um, one non-tenure uh, line professor, and then 11 um, in the university tenure line. None of those are assistant professors. Three are associate professors. The plus designates that all of them are in discussions about when to go up to professor, and it'll be fairly soon. And then eight are full professors. So very much on the more developed side of the career. We have two emeritus professors as well in the UTL line. And then there are 14 um, network medical oncologists, not in the division, they're separate, University Health um, Associates, but they're definitely aligned with us. And that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about with the partnerships. So as we think about this, we wanna think about where do we need to grow to support our mission? And thinking about the research, the patient care and the education. And so to me, as I put this together, I was obviously very, very struck by the fact that um, mes most of our earlier career hires and professors are in the CE line. And most of our very, very senior folks are in the UTL line. And so some of that represents the, the challenges of hiring into those different fields. Also, we've had such tremendous clinical growth that we've been focused there. So how do we kind of end up as a division being more balanced across the way. And so those are um, that's one of the things really thinking through. I wanted to then walk you through who are some of the folks in the division. 
and what are their other roles? So when we think about those in the lab doing amazing laboratory research, there are many with leadership roles outside of the division. Um, so Michael Clark, Stem Cell Institute, Christina Curtis from Molecular Tumor Board, Dean Felsher has many, many hats, um, including uh, TRAM and ART and MSTP, as well as the Director of Team Science in the department. Han Lee Ji uh, in the Genome Technology Center and George Sleds in the department um, as a senior advisor. And then there are many others. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few. When we think about our laboratory and translational research, we really have a truly phenomenal group of investigators in the division. I, I want to focus on strengthening um, our and by expanding our laboratory based faculty and really looking more towards the assistant professor level. We have had three recent MCL assistant professor hires, which are which is tremendous, who have a laboratory focus, though they are in the MCL grouping. Um, so Michael Coderduce, David Kurtz, and Jennifer Caswell Jin. Um, David and Jennifer will be joining very, very soon as they make those transitions out of the instructor roles. Um, Want to talk about strengthening our partnerships between bench to bedside to bench increase partnerships within and beyond the division with a translational focus, and then looking at partnerships in our related fields of PEAM, BMT, PEDS, HEMONC, within the SEI and then in the greater university. So I don't have answers for all of that, but I just wanted to put that out there as areas where we wanna be focusing. I'm gonna move now into the clinical research groups or our CRGs. Um, and what I've listed here are just, these are our different disease areas. So breast and cutaneous, endocrine GI, GU. And then the people who have been um, selected, and, and these are uh, working closely with the Institute. So Steve Artandi. Um, all of these are obviously um, well-known leaders in these specific disease areas. Um, and, and how do we then work all of us together to sort of strengthen these programs, strengthen our, our vision of what we're trying to do with them, um, with the, the guidelines that have always been there, that the CRG leaders are focused on mentoring um, those within the CRG at looking at the overall portfolio of trials within the CRG to make sure that we are offering the right opportunities for the patients that we see, as well as supporting the science and the investigative interests of those who are within the CRG. And then working together with the resources that are within the CRG to be able to support the trials moving forward. So as we think about expanded clinical research and partnerships within SCI, CCTO and beyond, we wanna think about supporting the CRG structure further um, Dr. Artandi has been working hard to get the financial resources to support the CRG leaders, and that has been accomplished, which has been, it will be a tremendous move forward. We are talking about further centralization within each of the CRGs, more research, resource sharing. Um, talk about the research timeout, and this is something I wanted to really keep talking about with people. The idea that when a patient is newly diagnosed and about to start treatment, every time there's a transition in care, before implementing that, we want to have this research timeout where people stop and think, have I actually thought about a clinical trial for this patient? If I'm not putting this patient on a clinical trial, why not? Is there not a trial available? In which case the CRGs want to be tracking that and trying to figure out where we're perhaps missing opportunities to provide better care through research for these patients? Was it something specific about the patient where they weren't interested? And that, of course, is always going to be there, and that's fine. But is there some reason the trial wasn't available to them that maybe shouldn't have been there? And how can we work on that to really get those metrics of understanding why we aren't having more patients go on trial? Want to raise awareness of studies and availability for all working in each CRG and CCP. So we want to make sure that everybody knows what are the trials that are available so that, again, when you get to that research timeout, you can easily look and figure out, oh, there is a trial. Let's talk about it. Is this going to work or not for this patient? Develop a portfolio of trials that balances the scientific interest of the CRG group with population of patients seen. Um, we do have open searches 
to expand the faculty doing all of this work as well. So developmental therapeutics is a key area of expansion. We're working very hard there. Um, Dr. Pata has been doing a tremendous job of holding that all together and trying to grow it. We're also looking to bring in another um, outside person as well. Um, GI clinical research lead, we're actively involved in a search there, actively involved in breast clinical investigator in the MCL line. And then looking specifically for future expansion in GU, melanoma, sarcoma, and of course, across as we continue to grow, but those are the areas we're most focused on right now. What about the network partnerships? As we talk about expanded clinical research, we want to strengthen um, partnerships across the network with joint events so that the Palo Alto-based faculty get to know all of the other medical oncologists working within the networks. So we started by having them participate in one of our faculty meetings. I wanna continue that quarterly, monthly conversation hour. This is a, a great meeting that Lydia Shapira leads and they've been participating in that. Having them come to retreats, quick, we wanna establish a way for us all to know how to reach each other quickly for curbside consults and discussions and for clinical trial access. So we're actually working on getting a phone app together where we'll all have that and be able to quickly be able to access, oh, I need to talk to someone um, who's in Pleasanton or for the folks in Pleasanton to be able to think, all right, who's doing this breast cancer? Who can I talk to? So to strengthen those connections, we want to have a quick trial reference manual to enable that research timeout and referrals when appropriate. Continued engagement to enhance connections across the network through these different ideas. We're working very hard right now to revamp an approach to clinical trials in the Cancer Center South Bay. And again, Steve's been really leading that effort. Implement new clinical research programs at Emeryville and Redwood City. Those are a little earlier still in their development. And then strengthen the connections with our Palo Alto VA colleagues led by Millie Doss. We have a lot of critical research partnerships to think through with radiation oncology, our surgical subspecialty colleagues, hematology, BMT, pediatric hemoc, population sciences, survivorship, biostatistics, radiology, nuclear medicine, and many of the medical subspecialties, especially as we are co-managing some of the toxicities we see now with immune therapy. This is a, a partial list, of course, too. Okay, what about clinical care? So the clinical care programs are organized in these CCPs and um, Eben Rosenthal is really at the, the head of that. Um, so I've just sort of listed them. It's the same groupings by disease type, different names of folks who are spearheading that. Really these CRGs and CCPs are working in partnership because to provide the best clinical care for patients, we also need to be thinking about the research opportunities and be able to do the research while clinically, you also need to be incorporated here. So these are, these are all partnered together very, very closely. And when we talk about clinical care further, the medical cabinet, Eben Rosenthal is the Cancer Center Medical Director um, and Sri Shishadri is our VP for Cancer Service Line. So working together, in discussions of, of how do we implement all of the structure to take care of patients. Um, we have many faculty members who play key, key roles here. Um, Doug Blaney in quality, Joel Neal in medical informatics, Kavitha Ramchandran for Pathwell, Sumit Shah for ITA, um, Sandy Srinivas for inpatient services, Patrick Swift, who's a radiation oncologist, but I listed him there because of his key role in Cancer Center South Bay and outreach, and then Suki Potter right now for phase one. And Lydia Shapira, this is an SCI role, as the director for cancer survivorship programs. So we're all working together, partnering to support our clinical growth. Um, then I wanted to talk about educational partnerships. Our fellowship program led by Greg Heestand and then Tamara Dunn in, in um, hematology, but they really work closely together. Fellow education spearheaded by Tyler Johnson. The Clinical Frontiers program and conferences with Alice Fan, and then um, to really focus on mentorship of our early, early career faculty, and that's the council, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. I also really wanted to emphasize that focusing on diversity and equity are core values of the division, and that needs to run through all of the other things that we are talking about here today and as we move forward. So then uh, my almost last slide is the Chief's Council. Um, I've gone through as I've given this talk, I'm listed many, but certainly not all of our uh, key faculty members within the division. 
everybody plays an important part within the division and, and having all of those partnerships together. But I'm asking a few people to, to step in in this chief's council. Um, and I'm looking at this as a way I can't possibly meet with all 55 people as often as I would like to, to be able to understand their views of what's going on. Um, this is going to be a council to provide a structured faculty outreach um, from the laboratory perspective, Dean Felsher, translational perspective, Alice Fan, clinical, Melinda and Suki, though, of course, that's all of the CRG leads, um, population sciences, Alison Korean. From a clinical care standpoint, um, Sandy Srinivas and Tyler Johnson. Outpatient is all of the CCP leads and also Samit Shah. Um, education fellows, Greg um, and also Tyler Johnson, Greg Heastan and Tyler Johnson. Conferences, Alice Fan. And then other really key roles, faculty affairs, Allison Crean is the associate chief for faculty affairs. Clinical mentorship, particularly thinking about those faculty who are doing a lot of time in the inpatient role on Med 9 and Med 11, uh, Lauren Maeda, and then for physician wellness, Lydia Shapira. So many people already have these roles, but to kind of come together on a more regular basis. So again, our vision statement, working together to provide world-class research, clinical care, and education focused on eradicating cancer. And with that working together, again, around the partnerships, which I've tried to over give an outline on during this talk. And so in conclusion, strengthening partnerships will bring us to the next level. Partnerships and persistence allow us to flourish, to achieve our mission of working together to provide world-class research, clinical care, and education focused on eradicating cancer. We will need to expand our research efforts with growth in laboratory and translational efforts, stronger connections with population sciences, and strengthening our clinical trial work with refocused CRGs, the research timeout, and research expansion in the network. Expansion of clinical care will proceed with continued partnership with SHC and focused education of trainees and faculty mentorship will remain vital. And with that, I will end and uh, give time for questions. So thank you. Well, thank you, Heather, for that wonderful and inspiring talk. Uh, certainly impressive all the things that you've done over the years and uh, how you've covered the landscape in oncology uh, incredibly deeply and beautifully. So thank you for that talk. Um, we have now uh, time for questions. So you can please enter your questions in the Q&A box. We have uh, a few to start. Mm -hmm. Frank Stockdale um, asks, uh, where do you see areas to which our laboratory program should be going? So that's a, a great question, Frank. I think that, um, again, from my vision as a, a clinical trialist and a translational investigator, I would really like to see strengthened partnerships from the basic science and the clinical program so that they're working in harmony together. I think we already have a lot of that. And certainly we wanna have room for people to follow discoveries, even if they lead away from where they think they had started. Um, but I would really like to see, um, as we have in some of the groups, such as lymphoma as an example, with the work that, that Ron Levy does, where clearly that bench to bedside to bench paradigm is right there, um, and many others as well. But I'd like to see more of that, where you can clearly see the connections between the, the clinical care and observations into the laboratories, back out as we're trying to figure out how do we best understand different malignancies and, and best treat them. So that's the way I think about it. Great. Other questions for Heather? I'm sure there are, there are many. Um, Heather, you had talked about um, this concept of a research buy out for, mm -hmm. um, for the, to you to deploy that concept in the clinics um, with regard to clinical trial accrual. And you mentioned it in your talk. Do you wanna expand on that a little bit more? Um, do you wanna say how you do that in thoracic oncology or how you'd like to see that done more broadly across the division? Sure, that's um, great, thanks. So um, the way that I envision it and the way that we, we are doing it in thoracic is 
when there's a, a new patient before the start of treatment, um, we stop and we think about our trials. So in our workroom, we have a big poster um, that the coordinators have kept up, which basically is divided up into newly diagnosed and then the different subgroups for there. So we're thinking about the molecular drivers, thinking about um, histology, um, and then list what trials we have um, to kind of have a quick glance, like, oh, right, I knew about that study or, oh, I forgot about that one is this patient potentially eligible and then a quick connection to the coordinator if there's one that looks promising. Also on that are um, the other types of trials we have. So if a patient has progressed on first line and they've been getting immune therapy, we have a grouping of you know, post-immune therapy options. And again, also um, in lung cancer, we have a lot of these driver mutations. So focus on the different driver mutations, which option we have. So before starting a patient on something new, it's that stop, think about it, is there a trial? And if there isn't, you know, trying to figure out why, why don't we have something that's for this particular patient population? And there might be a very good reason, um, but we want to be trying to really, as we're looking across the CRG to making sure that we have the right trials for essentially everybody if possible. But it's that idea of just as um, in the surgical world, before they operate, they do that timeout. We're like, are we operating on the right side of the body? And, you know, or do we know exactly what we're doing here? It's that same, that, that stop. It's, it's hard sometimes in the middle of a busy clinic when you're running a little bit behind to take that deep breath, stop, think, am I forgetting about a trial that this patient might be eligible for? And do I have a way of making sure that the next patient that comes in in this scenario that I, I might have a trial for them in the future. So that's the, the idea behind it is just getting us to think trial first and foremost um, in, the, in the context Great. of that busy clinical day. Got it, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Robert Harrington has a question. Uh, what are the best lessons from your mentors that you apply to your own leadership? Oh, that's a great question, Bob. Um, so I had a, mentor network. Um, and I think that uh, from, from David Gandera, he taught me the importance of the tumor board. He emphasized the importance of always thinking about everybody working with you and sharing, um, especially with the uh, people earlier on in their careers to make sure that they are given the opportunities to lead the projects to get their names on the papers to really help to support them. Um, Joan Schiller was also phenomenal at that. And I think that those are really key messages that I've tried to always keep in mind. It's, you know, we, we all get very excited about the work that we're doing. Um, but as we advance in our careers, if we're not also looking to those earlier on and making sure that they have those opportunities, then they can't grow up to where to we are in our career. So those were some of the really important messages. And then the, the specifics about working together, um, they were both people who, um, it, it, again, in that same vein of, of thinking about how to help uh, those earlier on their career, it's about that always sort of sharing. They, they weren't people who would sort of, oh, this is mine and I'm gonna just keep it, but to always be thinking about supporting others. And, and so th those are some of really the key messages. Great. Um... Question from uh, Dr. Kavitha Ramchandran. How do you see faculty men mentorship evolving, especially for junior faculty with such a growing program? Great question, Kavitha. Um, so I think that um, I, I'd like to see everyone identify at least two mentors. So I look at the CRG and CCP leads. So many of the CCP leads are our surgical colleagues. So especially the CRG leads to look at all of the faculty who are a part of their CRG, especially within the division and make those connections, reaching out um, at least every couple of months to just check in and see how they're doing. Um, I also, when I was thinking about the, the chief's council, part of that role is to um, make sure that every faculty, in addition to the CRG person reaching out to them, also has someone from the council reaching out to them and maybe a few. So if someone has a clinical research interest, say in um, lung cancer, um, but is also doing say MET11, um, then they would have the lung cancer CRG lead, but also 
Lauren Nieta and her role as sort of the clinical outreach person. Um, Dean Felsher has already been doing for the laboratory investigators who are early on in their career, specifically reaching out to them on a regular basis, um, touching base and seeing what other support they might need. Uh, again, I, with 55 people, I can't do as much of that myself as I would like to. So the idea is to have laboratory person, population science person, and a few uh, clinical research people, as well as folks focus on different aspects of the clinical care um, to be able to reach out on a regular basis to make sure that we have that, that net um, if people are starting to have challenges um, that they know who to talk to, um, and also just to encourage and support. Great, thank you. Dr. Evan Rosenthal asks, what are your key priorities for hiring medical oncologists? Great, uh, thanks, Evan. Um, so I outlined that we already have open searches right now in developmental therapeutics, and uh, Steve and I are working very hard on that recruit. Um, we also have a GI uh, clinical leadership position open. Um, we have had several people come through. I am in uh, negotiations right now with um, the person who was the top selection um, from that, that, um, that search. So hopefully that will pan out well in the near future. Um, and then Melinda Telly is leading a search for another breast cancer clinical investigator. Um, and we're uh, actively interviewing people. So those are the top three that we have open at the moment. Uh, Dr. Artandi is working to open another um, UTL uh, search um, as an investigator. And it's not clear if that will be someone in our division or not, but obviously I'm campaigning for that. Um, so that's moving forward. And then um, I'd like to see further growth in um, our melanoma program and our sarcoma program, as well as GU. And again, uh, Steve and I are talking pretty regularly, uh, looking across um, both the scientific and the clinical needs as to where we would like to see that growth. So those are the top areas right now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ranjananvani asked, the UHA alliances have been in place for a while, but have not translated into increased clinic clinical trial referrals or accruals. How is that going to change? So um, that's, again, a great question. And one of the things I tried to, to focus on, I think that um, with the network expansion, everybody is so busy um, that the work of really having us all get to know each other just hadn't happened in the way I would like to see it. And so that's something I've been trying to focus on over the last few months. If um, we can't think of each other as names and actual people, it makes it very hard to think about making those connections and referrals. And so um, really wanting to make sure that we all know each other um, that's part of this uh, phone app we're trying to work on too, is being able to quickly at your fingertips in the middle of clinic, be able to think who is working in South Bay, who has an interest in this disease for my patient in Palo Alto, who really doesn't want to be making the commute and vice versa for the folks in the network to be able to think, you know, this patient has had the standard approach that I know to do. And now I think they'd really do well with the trial. Um, who's the right person to call and to then have that at their fingertips. So it's not just this, oh, there's the Palo Alto group and there's a network, but that we're names and faces and connections and specialties. I'm also trying to work with the network physicians with this whole research timeout idea to be able to have them do that same process I'd like all of us to do to stop before starting a patient on that next line of treatment and be aware, is there a trial or not? And if there is a trial, how do I very quickly get them to Palo Alto to participate in that study? We're also trying to open more of the trials at South Bay and to strengthen the connections so that the trials at Palo Alto, we can figure out which ones could also open at South Bay and so to forge those connections stronger. So a lot of work to still be done, but I really see that we are poised to make those connections quite strong and be able to all work together as, as a real team. Thank you. And then this is our last question because we're at the top of the hour, but um, TPJMD, which may be Tyler Johnson, I'm guessing. Yeah. It seems that advancing the cause of equity can easily be lost the busyness of daily operations. Mm -hmm. What concrete steps is the division looking taking to focus on this and to make sure that um, we need partnerships with other hospitals? Or do we need partnerships with other hospitals? Okay, so a lot of aspects of that. Um, when we think about equity, I think um, there, there's the equity 
within um, all of us, right? And making sure that we're mindful that we are all um, working together in harmony um, and with awareness of, of um, bringing diversity to the table as a way to strengthen all of us. I think there's also the idea though for the patients and how do we make sure that we are having equal access to care for patients from different backgrounds, from different areas. Um, so one very concrete step has been our work with the Alameda Alliance and we meaning uh, many, many people, uh, not, not me so much, uh, but it's a really a key thing that um, you've done, Steve, that others have worked on where we are partnering with groups that are in the East Bay in traditionally um, underserved areas to be able to raise awareness of what opportunities they could have for clinical trials at Stanford and to facilitate the connections to have people come if they wanted to do that. Um, and so that right now is just being piloted and, and rolled out where interested uh, folks who are in the Alameda Alliance can be connected with a um, UHA physician in the East Bay so that that connection's uh, not too far of a travel to then be reviewed and see um, if there might be a trial and then those referrals are sent to Stanford for a quick review to see yes or no and if yes then to work out all of the logistics of getting someone here to be able to participate. Um, that's the first step. There are going to be a lot more of those sorts of connections that need to be made to make sure that we do, we are providing more equal access for people to be able to participate in the trials um, and as part of sort of the best possible care for every patient with cancer in the area. Excellent. Well, well, thank you so much, Heather. Um, thank you for this incredibly uh, informative uh, lecture and seminar, and, and we really appreciate hearing your vision and about your exciting discoveries over the years as well. Um, okay, so our, our next Frontiers in Oncology is going to be November 3rd, and that's gonna be Steven Rosenberg, uh, Chief of the Surgery Branch of the National Cancer Institute. Uh, uh, Dr. Rosenberg has been a pioneer in immune therapy. His title is Cell Transfer Immunotherapy for Cancer. So thank you all for your attendance. Thank you again, Heather, for your terrific talk, and we'll see you next time. Take care.